Welcome to this live recording. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today, our special guest for this episode of Book Club is Karim James Abu Zaid, a PhD, who is an award-winning translator of poets and novelists from across the Arab world. His most recent book-length translation include uh, Najwan Darwish's Exhausted on the Cross, which came out from NYRB Poets, and Adonis's Songs of Mihyar the Damascene, New Directions and Pen Penguin Classics. His work has earned him a NEA grant, translation grant, Penn Center USA's Translation Award, Poetry Magazine's Translation Prize, residencies from the Lannan Foundation and the Banff Center, and a Fulbright Fellowship, among other author, honors. He is the author of the book Poetics of Adonis and Yves Bonfoy, Poetry as Spiritual Practice, and Karim also translates from French and German and works as a freelance editor. He received a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California in Berkeley in 2016 with a dissertation on poetry as spiritual practice. He earned a master's degree in comparative literature from UC Berkeley in 2007 and a bachelor's degree summa cum laude in French with a minor in German from Princeton University in 2003. Karim, welcome to Book Club. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. So let's just start from uh, with a question on where are you calling from? Uh, so I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or the countryside just outside of Santa Fe. And, well. you know, we were talking right before we got started about where you grew up. Um, so you grew up in the Gulf, in the GCC, between Kuwait and the UAE. Um, but most, most, you know, kids, I, I grew up in the Middle East, too. Um, most kids growing up in the Middle East who go to sort of uh, English-speaking schools, don't grow up reading Arabic literature. Um, was that the case for you too? Yeah, that was the case. <laughs> I didn't read any Arabic. I didn't even really, when I was very young, I spoke Arabic and then uh, the school I moved to in the UAE taught French as a second language. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't even speaking Arabic very much growing up, which was a bit of a shame because I kind of had to start over a little bit in college. But yeah, that was the case with me as well. I was reading European authors <laughs> and American authors growing up. But were you but were you sort of a bookworm in general? Yes, I absolutely was. I just uh, didn't really appreciate the cultures I was living in at the time. Um, and I, when I left, I think was when... Uh, I realized, oh, you know, this is a part of me. And, and uh, uh, I think I'd maybe identified more as an, you know, my dad's from Egypt, my mom's from the state, from America, uh, the US. And uh, I identified more as an American growing up. And then when I, I think when I got to the States for college, uh, I realized, oh, I'm not, the, the label didn't really fit either. <laughs> and yeah. so I read, you know, many other people who've had similar experiences. I remember reading, uh, I think it was Edward Said's uh, autobiography, and he said something similar. You know, it was when he kind of left the Middle East that he took more of an interest in it. Weirdly, yeah. What? Um, when did you start? I mean, I took interest. I, I had a similar story, but I never really fell into contemporary Arabic literature. Um, I mean, I became. You know, there's there's certain things where you're you're like just supportive of their existing, them mm -hmm. existing, but you're not really a fan. Do mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Like, I love I love like um, uh, experimental classical music, right? Or orchestral classical music, but I don't like turn on John Cage, right? Um, when did you become a fan of contemporary Arabic literature and poetry? When did I become a fan? It was probably near the end of college when I began kind of really being able to read it in Arabic, like the poetry at least, and uh, novels as well. But I guess, yeah, towards my senior year of college, I think is when I started diving in a bit more deeply. And then when was I was probably 24, a couple of years after I graduated from college, I had a fellowship to study in Egypt um, for a year at the American University in Cairo. And it was kind of an intensive, uh, advanced, very advanced Arabic program uh, called CASA, which is still around. Um, and that was when I really, I think, got going with it more seriously. 
was that year because it was just nothing but Arabic. There was no time to do anything else. Yeah. Being in Cairo. Did it, but that, that's mastery of the language. But when mm -hmm. did you become sort of drawn towards the actual subject matter and the, and the, the literature, sort of the, 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 the artistry of the actual uh, prose and poetry? Uh, I would say senior year in college. That's actually when I started reading Adonis for the first time, which is a bit of a, a crazy thing to be reading and then trying to translate when you're still learning. Uh, but it was, yeah, it just felt so radical and so modern. And uh, I think it opened my eyes a little bit because I don't think I, at that point, I didn't realize there was that kind of literature being written in Arabic. And so I think reading Adonis for the first time opened my eyes to that. And then, you know, then I discovered a whole world uh, through that. And I think a lot of, a lot of what I read at the beginning was through, particularly I mean, with the poetry, at least it was through him. He has a great sort of collection. It's just called Diwan Asher al Arabi, but it's huge. It's three volumes. It's over, I think it's over a thousand pages if you uh, add them all up. And that was really, I started plunging into that and trying to read those poets, you know, and that starts at the pre-Islamic and, and goes all the way up to, to more modern times. So I think, yeah, it would have been senior year in college when I, I realized, oh, you know, this is, I'd always thought, you know, growing up, I thought, well, the European literature is, is more interesting and, and all Arabic literature is, is hyper-religious and it's, and it, that was totally skewed. I was completely wrong with that. And, uh, and yeah, so that was the beginning and uh, it just went on from there. <laughs> yeah. So when you approach um, doing translations, this may be a stupid question, so feel free to tell me if it's a stupid question, but who are you translating for? Are you, is, is the mission sort of, I want more people to read these pages or is the mission, is there, is there no calling whatsoever? Um, and just a sort of an exercise in getting this done. Or do you feel like there's a broader sort of mission to the work that you're doing? No, I do. I, I've always, uh, I really like bringing authors into English for the first time. And so introducing authors to, I mean, introducing English speaking readers to uh, Arabic language authors, they may not, they might not, you know, otherwise know. And so like with, you know, Rabia Jabber, I just, I couldn't believe he hadn't been translated yet. Right. That was one. And uh, uh, the, Project still kind of found me, but they were, um, that might be the mission, part of the mission. And then, you know, just sharing, it's not, I don't know if there's a specific audience um, because English is so much an international language. It's not like I'm writing, I mean, I translate for the most part into American, an American, literary American idiom. Um, but it's not that I'm just translating for an American audience. And, uh, with you know many of the books, they were you know distributed in the UK, and then uh, like with Najwan's poetry and Najwan Darwish's poetry, um, there's you know uh, edition English editions that have been released in India, and so um, and then sometimes the books are particularly with Najwan's poetry, they're translated into sometimes very minor languages from English, not Arabic, because you know there may not be someone translating from Arabic to Macedonian, for example, or something like that. And so, yeah, it's, but I don't know if there's not like one specific audience I'm, I'm targeting. Yeah. You know, like I would imagine when you, when somebody makes like a remake of, of a film, like a classic film, right. Or, um, or records a cover of a, of a song. Right. And somebody tells them, oh my God, I love, you know, I love, I love your cover of blank. Mm -hmm. The instinct I would imagine is like, oh, but you got to go read the original, right? And I'm so glad that you like mine, but you got to go read the original. You got to go. Do you feel that way? If, you know, if uh, some, if some uh, Palestinian kid comes up to you and says, oh my God, I love confessions. Um, and they speak Arabic. Are you like, no, 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 no. I'm glad you like mine, but just go read the original. Uh, well, I mean, I guess if they speak Arabic, I wouldn't expect them to read the translation uh, in the first place. Um, but no, you know, I've never thought about it like that. Like uh, the music analogy is interesting, like a cover. Uh, it's never, I mean, it's kind of a new work in English. It takes on its new life, a new life. Um, so, and I've actually never had, 
I've never had a book come out bilingual. Um, I have one book coming out later this year that I believe it will be bilingual. That's French and English. Um, and I think it would actually scare me a little bit to have <laughs> the, because I really let the, the English text just kind of become its own thing in a certain sense. I'm not beholden to, oh, it's got to have, the English poem has to have the exact same number of lines as the Arabic or those things, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, I don't think I would, if someone spoke Arabic, sure, I would tell them, well, you know, the original is, obviously the original is the original, but um, I wouldn't expect somebody just who speaks Arabic or reads Arabic to read the translation in the first place, I guess. <laughs> That's never happened to me. <laughs> yeah. I'll let well, you know I mean, what it does. <laughs> but I, I feel like there are a lot of Arabic speakers who don't, who read slowly or don't like to read and their command of uh, English is much, much better than the, the um, Arabic. And so mm. I, I wonder if you think there is, um, if there's something that they would be missing that is sort of, um, it would be a shame if they didn't, if they didn't, uh, read the original. I don't yeah, feel I that mean, way, but I wonder if uh, that's how you feel. There's always something that's missing. I mean, it really depends on the text. I'd say with my feeling is that with novels, a little bit less goes missing. Um, you know, I try to always capture the spirit of the text. Um, but having said that, there's, I mean, probably the most extreme example I can think of is Adonis, who with his poetry really so much of it relies on ambiguities and multiple levels of meaning in the Arabic and these sound effects. And it's, it's very um, difficult in that sense. It's not easy poetry to read. And uh, the, you know, with the one I did, it's like, it's really, I mean, it's a collection of poetry, but it's really like a 200, <clears throat> 200 page poem in a certain sense. Yeah, that's that one, Songs of Mihir, the Damas uh, Damascene. Um, which some people kind of consider the high point of modernism in Arabic poetry. It was published in uh, 1961 for the first time in Arabic. And uh, so that's one where, you know, I guess if you were gonna ask a scholar, they would say, yeah, a ton of stuff got lost. It's impossible to convey all that because he's playing so much with all these different, you know, meanings, right? Even just to use, a, I'm thinking about the very first text in the book and there's a line that says i think it's like uh ah uh, something like uncle al bahr min makanihi something like that i i i don't remember how we translated it but it's basically i moved the sea from its place or i displaced the sea right but the sea al bahr also refers to poetic meter and so he's and there's a whole you know there's a whole the whole that whole text where that appears you can read it in two ways as you referring to, you know, basically nature or is it metapoetic with these things like that? So there's other things like that, that those definitely get lost. At least I think it's the extreme case. It's very, very difficult to translate. Um, and it, there was, for a long time, he wasn't translated into English, even though he's this sort of towering figure in, uh, in Arabic literature. Did, you know, as you're working on this, uh, as you were working on Adonis, before we move on to Confessions and uh, Najwan, as you were working on Adonis, did it frustrate you that people in your sort of extended circles, family, uh, maybe not family, but uh, friends, colleagues who don't work in Arabic had never even heard of this towering figure um, because they don't speak Arabic. And it's like, this guy's a really big, <laughs> this guy's a really big deal. No, I, I don't think that frustrates me because that's sort of why you translate, right? Uh, if everyone knew Adonis at that point, then there's no, I mean, then, uh, I mean, not that everyone knows him now either, but uh, I guess it sort of draws you to translate and to try to to bring the work to, you know, maybe a couple of those people if you're lucky, you know, with, with poetry, it's a, a much more limited readership. But how did it poetry. happen? I mean, what's the story? How did this person never actually get, uh, never get translated in, in the way that like a Najib Mahfouz or, um, uh, you know, Tayyip Zadeh or other folks. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to remember when the first translations of Adonis' work came out, but they were very late and they were mostly with very small presses. Um, yeah. With Adonis, you know, it's just so difficult to translate. He's one of those people where that's, you know, it's a trope, but, you know, untranslatable. Everyone always uses that word with his stuff. 
And uh, it's kind of like Al-Mutanabbi. I, I still don't think we have a book by Al-Mutanabbi uh, in English, unless I'm mistaken. And he's probably considered, I mean, you know, if you're going to poll a bunch of critics, they might call him the greatest Arab poet of all time. Um, but his stuff relies so much on double entendres and all of these word plays and multiple meanings. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult to convey that uh, in English in any satisfactory way. Um, yeah, and even for, <clears throat> for that book, you know, the weird thing is that was the, um, that was, I wrote an essay about it once. That was the very first book I started translating, the Edenese, but it took 16 years to finish the project and find a publisher. And in the meantime, all these other books happened. Uh, so it was a weird, and it worked out very well in the end. And I'm glad we had that time because the translation got a lot better in the meantime. Sure. That wasn't really the right book. To, it's like, you know, starting out with Shakespeare, if you're going to translate from English into another language, it's not, you know, it's not the easiest project. But um, yeah, so that was a difficult one. Even for, for us, it was very hard to, and it's a co-translation. I did it with uh, uh, someone I knew from college. Um, but yeah, it took the longest, that book. Very cool. So let's talk about confessions. Um, when did you, you know, the, the original book came out in 2008. For those who can't see the screen, it uh, was written by Rabia Jabir, who mm -hmm. is a contemporary Lebanese uh, novelist, a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And the book takes place during the Lebanese Civil War in the, uh, you know, 70s, between 75 and 90. Um, when did you first start working with uh, Rabia? And how did this project come to come to light? Um, so like a lot of the projects, it's got, it's sort of, it found me a little bit more than I found it. I was, um, yeah, I, back then I was reading more for pleasure and I really liked his books. And uh, they just sort of called to me for whatever reason. And, um, and he's got a big range of, you know, uh, of, of novels. He was very, very prolific for, for many years. And he, he slowed, I don't know if he's published anything um, recently. Um, but I wrote, you know, it's funny. I was asked by, it was um, Chad Post, who's an American translator and publisher. He had a blog that a lot of people read back in the day. I think it's it's shut down, but it was called Three Percent, and they were running something. Uh, you know, which author from language X do you feel is most in need of being translated? And um, they, someone from from the website, contacted me and said, "Hey, would you like to write a post about Arabic?" And I said, "Sure." And I said, "Rabia Jabber is most in need of being translated." And it was like a paragraph. Literally, I wrote a paragraph. And that was that. And fast forward maybe two or three years, and um, he won the international, the IPAP, the International Prize for Arabic Fiction, which people kind of call the Arabic Booker. And uh, I can't remember which book he won it for. It wasn't one of the ones I translated. It might have been, uh, I think it was Druze, Druze Belgrade, the Druze, Druze of Belgrade. Um, anyway, when he won that, suddenly there was quite a bit of attention. I think it was work. America. Oh, maybe it was America. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, and then he won it for the Druze of Belgrade. Okay, yeah. Um, anyway, there was a tension on his work and I had been working with New Directions and they wrote me and said, hey, you know, we, we're interested in publishing Rabia Jabber. Can you put together a proposal for us? So, and that was literally how it started. And I just sort of, I mean, the interesting thing with his work is that if you look at the different in each language, he's been the first book that was translated was always something different. In French, they translated Veritus, uh, Veritus, a city underground, uh, something like that. In German, the the Riffa del Gornati was the first book that was translated. In English, it wound up being uh, the Mellis Report, um, which I did before Confessions. And you talk to people, and everyone's got a different take on on which book they like best because he's written so many. Um, but anyway, that was how it started, and I uh, I suggested doing two of his books, and and uh, we did, and um, I did hear that I forget who it was, and I don't know if it's been announced, but I think a couple more of his books are being translated now. Um, I can't can't remember who the translator was, but it was someone really good. I remember that, and so and I don't know who the press is either, but there may be some more books by him coming out in English. 
Um, Amazing. He's, yeah, he's an interesting, I felt very fortunate to be able to translate a couple of his books. Yeah. Okay, let's start. Uh, if you can just give a broad overview of what you think the book is about, if you were to explain it to like a 15 year old who's okay. picking up the book and you're telling it, telling this person what you think the book is about, and then we'll have you read a paragraph and then uh, talk a little more about it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I haven't read it in a few years. I never go back and reread novels that I've translated, but uh, um, so this is all coming from memory, but basically it's about the Lebanese civil war. It's about kidnapping and mistaken identity in the Lebanese civil war. And I guess this is, a, I gotta give a spoiler alert here, but um, um, at, the, at the end of the first chapter, you discover that basically, so it's not, not a huge spoiler, this doesn't come at the end of the book, but the narrator who, so I think a lot of it is about really the different factions in the civil war, though it doesn't get into the politics, but essentially what has happened is in one, one family, their child, what, their youngest child, the father's youngest child was killed in the civil war. And I think he's, I forget the age, maybe two years old at the time, something like that, very young. And the father snaps and he joins a militia. He starts kidnapping and killing people. I mean, he's, he's sort of lost it. And at one of these checkpoints, where essentially they're stopping cars, but they're, they're frequently gunning down the people in the cars if they're from the other side, so to speak. Um, they have gunned down a car and everyone is dead except a young child. And that child looks exactly like the son that this guy lost. And he takes the child and he takes him to the hospital and he winds up, he winds up giving the child his own son's name. And so this child whose whole family was actually killed by his father is raised by the family. And it's about discovering that and the repercussions of that and how that all comes out. So it's a very interesting kind of novel uh, in that sense. But you learn that basic point in the first chapter. That's, what, that's what's revealed. Amazing. Okay, so let's uh, have you uh, read the opening paragraph. Uh, this is mm -hmm. the first thing that uh, somebody reads when uh, they open up a book. Yeah. My father used to kidnap people and kill them. My brother says he, he saw my father transform during the war from someone he knew into someone he didn't. That's my big brother. I never knew my little brother. I know his picture. I know his face. He looks more like me than my big brother. That is, in photos, he used to look more like me. And I call him my little brother, as all, as all of us used to call him, in our heads, even if we didn't actually mention him in our conversations. His pictures still filled the house. What was I saying? I call him my little brother, even though he isn't my little brother. I call him little because he stayed that way, because he never grew up, because they killed him when he was a boy. Yeah, it's, it's a haunting, haunting paragraph. Um, and, and that and, little brother is the one he replaces, obviously, essentially in the family. But yeah. he has, he's actually not related to any of them. Yeah. This is a, an, the narrator, uh, Maroon, um, who is uh, talking. I, mm. I love, I love um, chapters that start with really short, simple sentences. Um, mm. So I'm curious, how many times did you rewrite my father used to kidnap people and kill them until you decided that that was precisely um, the sentence. You know, you know, that one was easy. I, I think that one came out the first time because I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same in the Arabic. I don't have the Arabic in front of me, but uh, it's that's a pretty literal um, translation right there. What was tricky was all the rest. You see all those interruptions, those mm -hmm. dashes, the, uh, the, the large M dashes there, the, because there's constant interruption and breaking off in the text because it's just, it's this person telling a story from, you know, from memory. And a lot of the book is also about remembering there's some like sort of Proustian moments where he's eating something and then all these memories flood back. He, this kid is kind of, this kid has been messed up because he doesn't know who he is. And he starts getting memories of his family from before they were killed. 
And, and these start merging with the memories he has of, of this family, of the one who, who took him in. And uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of interruptions, a lot of breaking off. Uh, even here, you know, he, at one point he says, what was I saying, right? And, um, but the, the book is just basically this person talking. At one moment, there's uh, the, you discover he's talking to someone and it's only one moment in the book, right? And uh, someone asks him like, you know, they, they just ask him one question and then he goes back in, but the rest of the book is just this person talking. So all this other stuff took a long time. And I have to say on this book, it's probably the only one, not the only one, but um, the editor at New Directions, the young editor, Tynan Kogain, did an incredible job with this. We worked together quite a lot on this text and he helped, he gave some great suggestions. And this was uh, by far of all the books I've translated, this one was the most collaborative in terms of working with an editor. Um, with Najwan's poetry, we work a lot together, me and him. But Was this uh, Rabia I, involved at all? He, uh, no, he wasn't involved in the English. What, what he did was, um, if I had questions, I often had questions about places in Beirut, what's this place? Um, uh, I'd email him questions and he would uh, give me very detailed he'd, he'd respond to them very quickly so he was involved in terms of make you know anytime i wasn't sure about something in the arabic uh i would check in with him and occasionally there was some lebanese dialect uh, it doesn't use a lot of dialect but occasionally there were some lebanese terms that that i wasn't familiar with things like that and uh, but other than that he wasn't involved no how much does he have to like it uh you know <laughs> you know i feel i don't know he I feel really fortunate. There were several sort of happy coincidences that led, you know, including what I mentioned, but that led me to translate his work and that led also him to accept me as a translator. Um, I had heard that there were other translators who had actually done whole novels of his and he, um, and they were never published and he didn't want them to be published. Um, but this was the, not Confessions, the other one that Malice Report was the first one that was that anyone had ever published. Um, he never really gave feedback. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember if I ever even sent him the manuscript. I may have, um, but he never. I don't know. He wasn't involved in that way. Yeah, he wasn't. He just wasn't involved, and he's he's not somebody who likes publicity or the limelight or anything. And in fact, after he won the IPAF he basically stopped publishing novels. And um, uh, so it's, you know, I don't know that he stopped writing them, but he stopped publishing them. And, um, and yeah. that may change. I hope it changes at some point, but he's not someone who likes publicity. He's not somebody who does interviews. He's not, you know, he's a private, he's a private man. And this is, you know, my feeling with him is always that he kind of channels these things. They really feel almost channeled to me. Uh, like he's just, they're just pouring out of him even this book, it's someone talking to him. But I, my sense when I read it, and there's another book that's very similar, it's called Beritus, A City Underground, where someone is also taught, it's basically someone talking to a journalist who works at El Hayat newspaper, which was his his job until until the newspaper shut down in Lebanon. And so, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's the sense I've always gotten with, with his stuff, is that he's almost a channel for these these voices that are coming out of, out of, for the most part, out of Lebanon's past. Do you, um, as you're working on uh, translating a novel like this and, and in a way that's not very collaborative, I mean, you're, you're doing fact checking with him, but um, you must feel a sense of ownership um, and a sense of connection to these characters, even though you didn't birth them. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly with this one, because it's, you know, first person narrator, yeah. um, basically in one point of view the whole time. And you kind of, uh, I guess maybe it's a little bit like, you know, method acting or something, you know, you're, you're just sort of, you're in it for now, this was a fairly short novel. So I've, I've you know, it, it's a bit different than when you're in it for 400 pages, but it's certainly, yeah, you kind of have to inhabit the role of that, that character and how would they, again, you know, as a translator, I'm always asking myself, you know, how would a native English speaking person convey this idea or this sentiment, or, you know, how does that come across? 
in English because often the words will be a little bit different than the Arabic um, in terms of like, if you were gonna just take a dictionary and translate each word side by side. Yeah. Cause I always wonder, I mean, especially when you're dealing with like such thick reprehensible and tragic uh, stories, if you can, if you can muster the type of love that is kind of needed to be able to write somebody's story. And, um, and I wonder, you, you know, in, in, uh, when you're, when you're writing the, the, writing the story, maybe you have some sort of direct connection to this, to this character, even though you don't write hundred percent of what you internally know about the person, mm. but you're channeling the channeling that he was doing. And so did you just feel like at some point you just needed to bypass it and create some other version of Marun in your head that you thought to be the original truth? Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I never thought about bypassing so much. Um, I think Rabia is a pretty clear channel. So if I can, <laughs> if I can tap into, to, to him, then, then it's, it's good enough. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you do, but I, again, you do, I did kind of let myself be inhabited quite a bit by the character, you know, and this was the last novel I translated. I haven't translated a novel since this one. I've done exclusively poetry uh, and it was so powerful. And if I never do another novel again, I'm really glad that this was the one I, I ended on, right? And, and yeah, and I think there's also, there's just, you were talking about mustering the love in the face of these kind of events, but it's sort of, there's a, sense of compassion or you know it's a lot of it is about bearing witness to this kind of suffering and um you know a lot of arabic literature is quite heavy because of the political cir circumstances you know even the two novels i did by rabia jabber there's this one which is essentially about kidnapping and and the civil war and then the other one is about the assassination of rafi Hariri and uh um, you know, the backdrops are always pretty, are often pretty violent. And then obviously with Palestinian poetry, you have the, the ongoing occupation, you know, in its seventh decade now. Um, but there's a sense of compassion, you know, it's not, it's not, everything doesn't have to be roses to, to have that. You know, it can yeah. also be about bearing witness, I think, to suffering. It's true. Um, okay. I guess my last question about the about this uh, the novel is what has the reaction been like um, since I guess it came out six years ago by this point? Um, any anything surprise you about the reception? Um, you know, it's the the books are kind of out of your hands once they once they're published and. Only recently did I become a little bit more interested in the, I guess I would call it the publicity aspect where I'm really trying to market the books a little bit more. Um, I think I'd always just assumed, you know, the pub publishers do that and, and publishers do do that, but they have limited resources. And so this was a book where I didn't really, I didn't put a lot of effort into marketing it or publishing or doing events. I don't, you know, I did maybe a couple of readings in the Bay area where I was living at the time, but um, the, so I don't even really know how many people wound up reading it. Um, critically, it did well. Um, at that time, there were two pen centers. They've since merged. Uh, in fact, they merged right after this book came out. Um, but there was a West Coast pen center called Pen Center USA, and then there's Pen America. And now they're all, pen, it's just Pen America um, that represents kind of the whole country. But this book won the uh, translation prize from Pen Center USA for best translated novel. And it was a uh, finalist, so one of the last four or five for the Pen America Translation Prize. So it got a uh, good reception critically in that sense, but um, there were not a ton of reviews. There were, it didn't do as well as I hoped, I guess, uh, in that sense. And part of that's probably on me. I'm just, I wasn't interested in doing that kind of publicity and stuff back then. It's also a bit harder for a novel, I think in some ways than doing um, you know, poetry. And Rabia is not interested in that stuff either. So, so yeah. it was maybe it was maybe a little bit of a shame. Um, but if some more of his novels are now being translated into English, uh, then you know it may 
that could revive some interest in leads, you know, and, and uh, I don't, re I don't know which novels those are or, or who the publisher is or anything, but um, you know, he's, I really think he's one of the great uh, Arabic language novelists of, of, you know, his generation. And uh, I think these books will have a longer, there's going to be a longer time span, but it was not a bestseller. <laughs> Let's put yeah. it that way. Interesting. I'm always curious how the, how, what the reaction is in, um, in the Arab world and particularly in, in Lebanon and the Lebanese diaspora, uh, because it's about mm -hmm. Lebanon. Um, let's move on to, uh, the second selected text, um, which is Najwan Darwish's Exhausted on the Cross. Um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Najwan. This is your second, uh, second project with him. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about who he is, how you started working together, and why you keep on working together. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's a contemporary Palestinian poet. Uh, he was born in 1978, um, so a couple of years before me. Uh, we sort of, again, started working together a little bit by accident. Um, I started translating his poetry for a poetry festival in San Francisco, and the organizer contacted me. And uh, he'd had some other people translate some of his work, but, but not books. Um, into English, just individual poems. And uh, yeah, we started working, we, we enjoyed working together. Uh, we, it was more, much more collaborative, for example, than with Rabia. And over time we became friends and the first book kind of happened by accident. Uh, I was just doing a very informal reading while I was at a residency. Um, I was at the residency actually to work on the first novel by Rabia Jabber. And uh, we did a kind of informal night with, uh, this was in Banff in Canada with um where people could read anything you know it was just kind of fun there was it was just among the people in the translators residency it wasn't a public event but people could read anything but not the project they came to do the not the project they got for the residency so people were reading their own stuff or whatever or singing or um and i read i, I read some of najwan's poems uh and the editor from nyrb was there um and he said, hey, that stuff was really good. Send me a sample, maybe we can do a book. And that turned into the first book. And now- um, You read a translated versions of them? I read translate, yeah. I, I, had, I had been translating his work and just for different journals and stuff, but we didn't have the idea to do a book, really. And then, uh, and I didn't know what to read it this evening, but I was like, oh, I've got all these poems by Najwan and they're really good. Like I'll read, I mean, I thought they were really good. Uh, I'll read those. And, uh, and then that turned into the first book with NYRB Poets. And he's now the first poet to have two books in that series. Um, That's cool. Yeah, they're not like a press that sort of takes a poet and then just publishes their, or, you know, their whole work or whatever. Um, so yeah, that was how that started. And, and now we're good friends and we, we work really well together. There's a lot of back and forth. Najwan's English is excellent. Um, and uh, He's, uh, yeah, he's quite hands-on, which is good. And we go, it's a very collaborative project um, working with him, but we also have a, I'd say a similar philosophy where for both of us, it's, you know, the final determ determinant of what choice we make is which one is better as poetry in English, right? That's where, that's where- uh, What does that mean? That. Say that again. What um, do you mean by that? If we have a couple options of how to, let's say, how to translate something, and we're trying to figure out. Oh, there's out, like a Darwinian aspect of which, which translation works better. Well, there's always different possibilities with something, right? And uh, multiple meanings, and how do you, you know, even sometimes you'll, you might flip the order around on some verses or something, but we both kind of have a similar thing that it needs to be poetry in English, right? If it's not poetry in English, if you've just, you've got the meaning, but everything else is lost then uh, that's not successful, right? And, uh, you know, I think, you know, many decades ago, when I look at a lot of the Arabic trans translations of Arabic literature into English that were coming out early on, the emphasis, you know, most of the translators were academically trained. It wasn't literary training so much. And the translations, I think many of them read a bit stiff. And they don't feel, you know, there's not that same attention to feeling and impact and those kind of things. And um, that's changing now. It's certainly, it has changed. I would say there's a ton of people doing great translations from Arabic. And, but I think, you know, a few decades ago, it, it was a little bit of a different culture. And mm -hmm. a lot of the translations were coming out at academic presses, right? So you've got, 
it's it's just a different it's a different uh, aesthetic approach, I would say. Interesting. So let's. Uh, I think you selected the first uh, the first poem in the collection mm -hmm. to read. So there's seven seven sections of the collection, and you are mm -hmm. going to read uh, Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, yeah, which is a mountain in Haifa. It's the mountain that kind of overlooks Haifa on the sea, and all the places that are mentioned in the poem are also in Haifa. Um, Mount Carmel. Though you're right beside it, you can't call out to the sea, neighbor, come join me for a coffee. Instead, and without my permission, my other neighbor, Carmel, visits me through the window, never trying to enter by the door. It owns the place at any rate. Sometimes the church bells reach me from the depths of Wadi Misnas, and some mornings the call to prayer comes in quietly from the Istiklal Mosque, born on an ancient breeze from Wadi Salib. And the Baha'is keep giving alms and filling the city with Persian gardens that escaped from Shiraz. And in Kababir, the followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed maintain their naps of devotion and hunt for truth in the prophet's words. As for the holy men among the Druze, their poems reach me from the temple at the foot of Mount Hermon, like the white headscarves of their women, the ones that hide a thousand years of darkness. And I, aimless between the mountain and the sea, I who follow no one but myself, what am I doing here among all these devotees, here where time has found its end? Beautiful. Um, are there any um, any uh, poems in the collection where you kind of think that the English works better than the Arabic? Uh, I don't know if I would say I, I, I don't know if I can really say that. Um, <laughs> that's not is that that's not my place to judge. <laughs> no, I mean, or not, not better, but that you maybe I'll, let me say this differently. <laughs> <laughs> where you you like the the sort of the poetry of the English better than the Arabic or I like it better than the Arabic I guess I don't really think in terms of better I'm really just trying to capture what's most important uh in the Arabic um you know occasionally you get lucky and there's some sound things that happen in English that maybe sure uh are are, are uh <laughs> extra impactful or something <laughs> like that but uh, I don't I don't know I can't really say that um I hope That's, that the English captures the spirit of the Arabic and is is uh, close to as powerful as the Arabic. That's what yeah. I'm shooting for. Okay, across the board. Nice, nice dodge, Kareem. <laughs> yeah. I know you put these up on the website, so I have to, uh, yeah, have to be to, careful. You have to be, be careful. Um, well, let me ask you this: What's um, for somebody who's not a translator, like I'm not a translator? What's different about um, how do you approach poetry differently? Um, uh, than prose. I mean, you sort of alluded to it earlier um, mm -hmm. that it's this like four dimensional sort of chess thing going on where you're trying to get all these different things to 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 work. Um, but is there anything else that's uh, that's different? Yeah, you know, I don't think there's a. I wouldn't say the differences are fundamental, but there's a difference in emphasis, right? So, you know, I read all of my translations out loud when I'm editing them. Like that part's very important. You've got to hear it. And uh, that's important for novels as well. But I would say the sound aspect is extra, extra important for poetry, right? So there's just more emphasis on that. A novel still has to sound good too. There needs to be a flow. There needs to be a good rhythm. Um, but, you know, you don't want 10 super long sentences one after the other, you know, unless you're, I don't know, translating Proust or Thomas Mann or someone like that. It's yeah. not, that's not how you would do a novel usually. Um, but uh, so it's just a dif difference in emphasis. And then you just, you have fewer words to work with in a, novel, in, a, in a poem, right? So that part is a little bit trickier also. Like with a novel, if there's a cultural reference, you can sometimes kind of insert an explanation about it, right? Like, I think you had a sample up there that had fool, right? Which is, yeah. you know, you could say, oh, you know, whatever, boiled fava beans or however they're preparing it in whichever country is you know in, in Lebanon yeah. it's prepared a little bit differently than Egypt, uh, but you can put an explanation in there if you need it. In a poem, you it's okay. very difficult to get away with that, uh, and so those there's those kind of considerations, 
I would say. And above all, sound, you know, there's a musicality to poetry. Um, I try to always something, I guess the one thing I would do with a poem that I don't do with a novel when I'm translating is I like to read a poem, you know, when I have a very polished draft, I like to read it and not think about the meaning at all. Like actually try to completely ignore the meaning as if it were in a foreign language and I can't understand any of it and just listen to the sound and see how it, it sounds and how it lands. Yeah. Uh, and that's something I wouldn't, I don't do. I've never done with novels. Um, so yeah, that. Yeah, that's interesting. Like to like to think through sort of like the melody and the, the rhythm of it um, without the, the lyric essentially. Yeah, and that's that was particularly important, I'd say, for Adonis's work because so much of it relies on sound effects, and echoing, and and that kind of thing. That was really important for that book um, because mm -hmm. the Arabic, it's you know he uses a lot of rhyme, and I mean it's an older book, uh, you know, from sixty one that one in Arabic, um, and fewer poets are rhyming in the same way now in Arabic. Najwan's poetry is is more contemporary. Um, but yeah, for, to capture that in English was really important, I think with, with Adonis's book, yeah. but with Nejwan's, I do it too. So, um, this, this collection, uh, exhausted on the cross, I'll ask you the same question I asked you for confessions. If you were to explain mm -hmm. to a 15 year old, what this collection is about, um, what would you say the collection is about? Oh, that's hard. Uh, with poetry, it's hard because you don't want to reduce it um, to something. But I would say there's maybe some overarching themes, I guess. Um, there's a lot of it is about suffering um, and the injustices that are taking place sort of all over the world, not just in Palestine. But um, I would say the overarching themes are suffering and how how people respond to that let's put it that way and how how people respond to injustices and um so there's a certain notion of resistance i think across a lot of Najwan's poetry but it's not <clears throat> it's not always us versus them you know i mean it's not black and white there's a a sense of there's a lot of gray areas in many of these things and and it's not about uh necessarily labeling groups of people as enemies, right? But it is still about calling out the injustices and calling them out very forcefully, I would say. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you our quick Q&A and then maybe we'll have a couple of questions from the audience. So the first question is, what are you reading these days? Uh, so I probably shouldn't say this, I don't read a lot. Um, I haven't been reading much literature. I. I've been reading a lot of books on meditation and stuff. So, and usually I have several that I'm reading at one time, but uh, the one physical book I'm reading, which I, I grabbed uh, before the thing is called Coming Home. It's by a guy named Lex Hickson. Um, Coming Home, the experience of enlightenment in sacred traditions. And so it looks at some different figures from India, from, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, from Sufism, from Christian mystics. I think there's a chapter on Meister Eckhart, Plotinus. Um, but sort of uh, what we could call spiritual experience or enlightenment uh, in across different traditions. So, can you say the name of the the book again? Coming home. Who wrote it? Coming home by Lex Hickson is the guy's cool. name. And, cool. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Yeah, this was a. I, you sent me some of these questions before. I had to think about this one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I would love to shadow the historical Buddha, I think, for a day was the one, the name that came up right away. There's obviously a lot of people, but I would love that's, you know, Gautama Siddhartha was his real name, but the person 2,500 years ago who, who we would now refer to as the Buddha, uh, I think it would be fun to shadow him for a day um, in the sort of second half of his life when he was teaching and had a community and stuff around him. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. There's all these myths and stuff, but you want to know kind of what was it really like, you know? Uh, what is the everything. what is the 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 single myth that you hope to confirm? <laughs> I I just want to see what he's like, really. You know what I mean? What what's the you know they the there's always a personality behind the figure, you know, and so I think that that's uh, 
I guess I want to see that comes out in these in more in your day to day interactions, you know, with yeah. people. So I guess there's not one thing in particular, but it's more like, what was this person's personality, you know, because so much of that I'm sure got clouded and obscured behind the sort of mythologizing that happens with with any religion. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, you know, I think I'm going to say about translating um, uh, in general, like my line of work. Uh, I think there's a, a, you know, people think it's it's all about meaning, right? You translate meaning, you're using a dictionary all the time. And those are not the biggest challenges in the work. Getting the meaning across is usually pretty easy. It's all the other stuff, the tone, the sound, the the, the emotional impact, those kind of things um, that I think are where the real skill comes in in translating. If it was just about meaning, we could use Google uh, yeah. all the time. And Do I'd be you, out of the job. <laughs> yeah. Um, given that, given that most of the artistry of what you're doing has to do with all the other things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can you effectively translate something that you don't? really enjoy not like a paragraph but like a a, a larger work Oof. with a larger work i think it's hard you probably could um i imagine you could but uh, uh, do you, could you <laughs> not could one <laughs> could, could you i <laughs> uh a larger work that i don't really enjoy i i have to enjoy it on some level there has to be some kind of connection i don't have to think that you know this you know, necessarily that this author is going to win the Nobel Prize or something one day, right? But yeah. I have to enjoy it on some level. There has to be some kind of redeeming quality for me. And then I think I can translate it. Yeah. Um, cool. But I'm lucky, you know, what I'm translating now and Najwan's work and Rabia's work and, and, and uh, most of the projects I've done have been passion projects as well. Yeah. You know, I do them for the pleasure because I love them. So, and Adonis as well. Um, so I've been, I think, fortunate in that, in that regard. But I do plenty of technical translating that's less interesting for me and, you know, academic stuff or, or different essays that are interesting, but not, they're not, it they doesn't feel like my, it's not like every time I sit down to translate, it's, it's my highest calling is, is, is sure. coming forth. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the last question is, outside of your profession, whose work inspires you? Um, so there's a, a meditation teacher in India. Her name is Mata Amrita Nandamayi, which is a long name, but she's better known as Amma, which just means mother. Um, and a lot of people know her as the hugging saint because she'll go and hug tens of thousands of people in a couple of days. Um, wow. but her work inspires me because in addition to, I mean, there's a lot of great, great meditation teachers out there. Um, in different, you know, it doesn't have to be any particular tradition. I think the core of a lot of it is the same with meditation. Um, but her work really inspires me because she has a ton, a huge number of humanitarian projects, bringing uh, food to people, bringing shelter to people, not just in India, but around the world. I think they operate in about 40 different countries. Um, and so she's someone for me who kind of embodies all of the everything that meditation is about, which is not just the sort of insight and wisdom you get from sitting quietly sort of on your meditation cushion, but also uh, the aspect of compassion um, and just helping people. Um, and she does that on a huge scale, uh, not just with her, you know, her programs where she's hugging folks, but all of the, the massive organizations that, uh, that she runs, uh, you know, feeding, you know, I think it's millions of people around the world now. So um, even here, even here in Santa Fe, they have a, a food project um, that uh, one of her sort of chapters runs. So wow. yeah, that's, wow. yeah. The Hugging Saint Ama would be who, who I would say outside my profession inspires me the most right I, now. I've never heard of this person before. I don't know that she comes to the Middle East. She comes to the States and does her programs and she comes to Europe. Uh, I don't know that she, and then in India, when she does her tours, um, it's like, I mean, it's huge stadiums that they have to rent out because wow. everyone, she's kind of considered a, in India, they consider her a saint, but she teaches meditation. She teaches, um, and then she does all this humanitarian work as well. So, yeah. Okay. The last question I'll end on is, mm -hmm. um, 
if you had to rewrite that blog post, that paragraph um, for, you know, whatever it was, the 3%, um, hmm. who would you uh, list in that uh, new 2022 paragraph? You mean right now? Like, yeah. uh, um, who, who, who is in dire need of being translated that is writing in Arabic right now? Um, it, it could even be more of the same uh, people, but who, who do you think really uh, needs a broader English readership? I'm not sure um, if, so, if you were talking about someone who hasn't been translated. Or who uh, hasn't pr- been translated enough. Hasn't been translated enough. Oof. That's a difficult one. Um, you know, the truth is the last six, seven years, I've been spending most of my free time meditating and not reading. So I don't think I, I actually don't feel I'm qualified to answer that. Uh, that would be better someone, I'm not reading a lot of contemporary stuff outside what I'm translating in Arabic right now. So uh, I, I don't think I have an answer for that. I, you know, I'll give you, just to put an answer out there, somebody needs to translate Amutanabi properly, but that's not a, con- a contemporary author, obviously. Sure. Okay, but, uh, and that's an impossible project that I, I feel, already I feel bad for whoever tries to do it. I'm sure several people have and have, yeah. have gotten nowhere with it but uh yeah that would be i think it would be nice to see some of the canonical works of classical arabic um uh start being translated not just on Mutanabi, but there's so many great you know al Bukhtari and maybe just some of those great poems that you read when you take a course on classical arabic poetry from the abbasid period especially it'd be nice to have some of those translated very cool. Okay, so we have one question from Dima in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, does the breakdown of meter in the 40s and 50s change anything for the translator's task? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question um, from Dima. Uh, and it's it's a hard one to answer. It's hard to, you know, so... A, Adonis or Adonis wasn't, he wasn't one of the first people to break down the meters, right? He kind of came, he was sort of, people had already started doing it and he came in and he really, I'd I'd say he honed it a lot. Um, And they were playing with the meters. It wasn't that meter was discarded, but there was uh, playfulness with the poetic meters and uh, they were being kind of molded in a new way. And the thing, there's no way, because meter is so different in Arabic than in English, there's just no way you can't, there's there's no way to mirror them, right? It's very, very hard. They, they, the two systems are totally different. Um, so I think what's important with that is you wanna try to capture a sense of, of, of it being modern, I guess, right? So with, so one thing, I guess this was a consideration with the Adonis book, right? Um, is how to make it feel modern and not dated, even though, you know, now the text when I, I was working on it, you know, by the time it was published was over 50 years old. So that's really the task um, is how to capture that modern feel in English. And we use meter in English a lot in that, but it it breaks a lot. And we we try to do a little bit of that, but it's, it's not the same effect as in Arabic. There's, there's certainly, it's difficult to mirror that. Well, and Adonis uses a lot of rhyme, and we opted not to do that because the rhyme sounds somehow modern and kind of incantational in the Arabic. Uh, but in English, end rhyme is usually not, uh, it's, people don't use it a lot in poetry anymore. They use it for humorous poetry or for things like that, but not, uh, it doesn't have the same effect in Arabic, so in English, sorry. So we opted not to use rhyme, except for maybe some. Uh, internal rhyme and we use different sound effects put it that way cool. but it's a good question it's a really good question uh Kareem, thanks so much we've run out of time um thank you Mickey. thanks everyone for coming yeah so this is going to be up on youtube and up on the podcast tomorrow um and we will uh, hope that people share it and you can share it on your website and social media it's easy to find Kareem. just uh, search him online and you'll find a way to get in touch Kareem, thanks so much Thank you, Mikey. See you, everyone. Thanks for coming.